Welcome to Building Worldviews, the Praxis Circle podcast where we talk with experts as you shape your worldview. I'm May Lily Lee. These podcasts originate from video interviews you can find on our website, praxiscircle.com. Become a member by registering at the site and subscribe or follow this podcast for the latest episodes. In episode three of our four-part series with economist Anne Bradley, She explores capitalism and socialism from a Christian viewpoint, and she offers that socialism can't solve the problems of poverty. Well, we are, I think we're um, moving into counting the cost now. Okay. Okay. And I I have a ton of follow-up questions, but I'm going to stay on plan. All right. And we talked about this some when when we first met, Uh, just the background of the book, um, um, how, how did the book come about with Michael Novak in the beginning chapter? Just talk about that a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah. We uh, had done a first edited volume um, called For the Least of These, and it was really bringing theologians and economists together to try to understand a Christian perspective of how to help the poor, help care for the poor. And we felt that it was a really successful project. So we said, okay, what's our next project going to be? And we really wanted to do an edited volume. The benefit of that is that you have a lot of voices. So we have uh, many authors. uh, And we wanted to do the same thing, bring in economists, but also bring in theologians. And so when we were really wrestling with what are we going to talk about, there's so many things we could. uh, We said, okay, you know, here's the thing that we're observing is that there's a lot of calls within Christian circles for socialism. This is becoming a more popular term. Uh, It sounds good on paper. Is it good? Should Christians be socialists? I mean, this is a question, right? So um, the the flip side of that coin is, how should we feel about capitalism? Um, And we've talked already about how capitalism is a complicated word that brings up a lot of emotions. So we said, let's deal with that. Let's really assemble a group of authors who are qualified to speak on this topic. And we didn't want to be cheerleaders for capitalism. There's a thousand books out there, and there are, some of them are good, that just say, here's why you should be for capitalism. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to take people and say, who are the people that are really bringing legitimate questions? I'm a Christian. Should I be for capitalism, or is it bad? We wanted to take those honest questions and try to address them. So each chapter is an effort to address a critique that Christians frequently bring against capitalism or that, you know, they're questioning. And so each chapter is an attempt to take the reader through that critique. And, and then again, they can decide, the reader can decide. And I, when we came to this idea, we said, okay, Novak has to be part of this. Um, and we reached out to him and he said he would be willing to do it. And we said, look, this book, um, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, uh, for many people, they cite that book as a life-changing book. Uh, in terms of it changed their minds, it changed their hearts. They went from, again, advocating for socialism to more advocating for a free society. And I think that's Novak's position himself, right? He had that um, revelation. And so when we asked him, can you write an updated version of that book, you know, um, for the 21st century in light of the fact that we have a new generation that's clamoring, supposedly, for socialism? And he said, yes, and we're just very blessed that we were able... Uh, to, to have him be part of the book. Um, in, in just a few sentences, do you feel like it's front of mind to you to be able to state the argument of the spirit of democratic capitalism? What is the, the main theme of the book? I actually asked um, Mr. Novak that question, and I don't think he gave me the right answer, but he gave me a really good answer. <laughs> well, I don't know if uh, I'm going to give you the right answer, no, either, no. but I'll give you my interpretation yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah. The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism is a really important book because it's also not just a cheerleading book. It's not written by someone who's never questioned capitalism. I think that's the power of it. So what is he talking about in the book? The main idea in one sentence is that um, this kind of idea of a three-legged stool, right? That, That to have a flourishing society, you have to have these pillars of freedom. You need economic freedom. You need political freedom, and you need pluralism. You need a society where you can debate ideas, right? And so he very much understood that there's a certain ethos, a certain system of ethics that has to undergird a society where we're going to be free, where we're going to live amongst each other. 
And that's a really powerful message and I think relevant for the 21st century. So his message lives on. Do you, do you remember his connection to Centesimus Annus? JP2? I'm not very familiar no, with, that, no. with that, no. Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, good. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, do you think, you talked about that hockey stick mm -hmm. um, that that has really gotten a lot of pub. My favorite video is the one with Hans Rosling, I He's believe. He's fabulous. You know. Um, do you think that could have happened without um, Judeo-Christianity? The hockey stick? Yeah. I don't think so. I think that the hockey stick is predicated upon truths that come right out of scripture. Now, some people have disdain for the scripture, don't want to accept the scripture, but interestingly, they still accept some of the principles. Let me just talk about one, property rights. Property rights um, don't work because we tell people to respect them. They work because people believe that it's valuable to respect other people's property and to have your property respected. So this is a deep, how do I say this? This is a value or a belief that people have to hold deeply for it to work. No business is going to make an investment in a society that's um, you know, rife with civil war or sectarian violence. Why? Because you open up a factory, you might employ people for a couple days, and you know, grenades hit it the next day and the investment is gone, right? So it's, it's, we know how to generate economic growth, but it's, it's not enough to say, okay, everybody, you should believe in property rights. People have to deeply believe that. And when they deeply believe that, they will respect others. So, right, it would be easy for me to go to my neighbor's house and steal their stuff. Why don't I do it? <laughs> I don't do it, not just because I would go to jail if I do it. I don't do it because I believe it's wrong to violate the property rights of others. So I think that these ideas that come from the Judeo-Christian heritage, property rights, work, savings, right? Savings mean you're, you believe that you have a long time horizon, and that you're bringing up families. These, import, these values are critical, I think, for this um, massive explosion of wealth we've witnessed over the past 200 years. So the next question is, um, it does um, self-limiting you know, you need to be virtuous, but also self-limiting at the personal and institutional level mm -hmm. for it to work. Um, positive freedom type thing. I may have just answered the question for you. Um, I think any free, comments? free right. enterprise or market-based society works because, again, we follow certain codes of conduct, certain rules of ethics, at least most people most of the time. You're never going to get perfect. Um, you're going to always have theft. You're always going to have greed. You're always going to have violations of these norms. But the key is to get most people following them most of the time. This is what Adam Smith was worried about. He wasn't worried about perfecting human beings. So he was very wise there. He knew that wasn't possible. So society, to get it to run well, isn't about finding the perfect people to run businesses or the perfect person to be the president or trying to find the Mother Teresas everywhere because we're just going to fall short of that. People are not generally altruistic all the time. And so, you know, I do think it's that it's self-limiting behavior that's the key. Again, I gave the example that I could steal from my neighbors and I could be temporarily better off, but I restrain myself from doing that. That's a, that's a code of ethics that I hold myself to. And when we all, or when most of us restrain ourselves in that way, there's a lot more flourishing. So freedom isn't about using the state to tell us what to do and what not to do. It's actually about getting a deeper set of norms and ethics that encourage people to do that on their own. I make my own choices not to steal, right? Because stealing in the long run is much more costly of a behavior for me than being productive. Okay, when, when you're talking about, again, to go back to the hockey stick and uh, coming out of the, the Judeo-Christian world, do you think there's one way to do to do it, or are there three or four different ways, you know, to get to the same to the same phenomenal achievement that Hans Rosling shows us? Talks about. Is there one? I mean, or you know, it's an interesting question to me. I have my own answer, but I'm curious. One way, think? meaning one way to construct a society. Is that what you mean? 
Yeah. 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 One way, I mean, one path. I mean, when you, let's put it this way. When you think in terms of um, Novak's three-legged stools, yeah. there are certain things that make the leg a leg and not 50 legs mm -hmm. or one leg. You know, but there are certain things. Is it, is it, are there other three-legged stools out there that, yeah. that would work to produce the same level of poverty reduction? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, the answer to that question is there is not one way, one unique way, but I think there are principles that always have to be in place. So the principles always have to be there. What are the principles? When we talk about, as economists, about economic freedom, uh, we're actually talking about something that we empirically measure. So we're looking at the rule of law. We're looking at the protection of property rights. We're looking at, at the size of the state. Um, People, are people of, uh, free to open businesses, to engage in trade, to trade internationally? And we go in and we measure that. That kind of data that we can acquire, there's a lot of ways to get to that. So if you look at, let me just give a concrete example. It took the United States 150 years to experience their industrial revolution. That's a long time. We had to have electricity before we had you know, cell phones and we had to vent, invent all these things from scratch. Japan, this is a country that goes through their industrial revolution in 20 years. Um, the countries that have not yet experienced an industrial revolution that Hans Rosling talks about so well, they will experience their industrial revolution in two decades, maybe less. So there's not one way. It doesn't take everybody 150 years. Um, here's another example. What we're seeing in the developing world is people are living in mud huts and when they get a little bit of an income increase, they get a cell phone. It's very weird for us to look at that and say, you live in a mud hut, but you have a cell phone. Because why? It took us a long time to do it. We had the house, right? We had the brick and mortar, but we, way before we had the cell phone. That's, so it's not going to look the same, but the principles in play are always the same. You have to have economic freedom. Economic freedom gets better political freedom and better political behavior, right? And that is a self-reinforcing thing, potentially for even more economic freedom. And you have to have religious freedom, which is not you know, a theocracy that's imposed by the state on the people. So I think the principles are always there, but the way it's manifested can be very different. Okay, Dave, I've, I've got a couple of questions on... Um on socialism before we turn to your chapter. That's kind of how we, how we end it okay. uh, in this section. And then we go on to the really the easy stuff, which is you get to say what you want about America. Okay. <laughs> okay. But um, so you mentioned the idea of socialism is experiencing a comeback, which is phenomenal to me. Okay. Having been born as a middle boomer and lived with the two superpowers and whole half the world's doing it and it totally fails. All right. But uh, why is socialism experiencing a comeback today? I'm not sure I can answer why socialism is experiencing a comeback because as somebody who thinks about economic systems a lot, it's very bizarre uh, to me from an efficacy standpoint. In other words, it's, it's, it doesn't have a lot of capabilities. Um, but I think here's what I... I have come to this conclusion. It sounds good on paper. <laughs> I have a list of a lot of things and I always say, this sounds good on paper. It sounds really good to say there's some people who are very rich. Um, Bill Gates has a bunch of billions of dollars, right? We could take a billion from him and he will barely notice. That may be true. doesn't mean it's right, but it may be true that we could take a billion or two from him, from George Soros, all these rich guys and give it to poor people. It sounds good on paper, but it's not um, addressing the underlying issues of why people are poor. So see, societies that have economic freedom liberate people as, and liberate many people permanently. So that redistribution I just talked about, here's all we're doing. We're taking, some, we're taking money from one place and we're moving it to another place. And then what happens when all that's gone? Well, then they need more, right? The poor stay poor and they just depend on the redistribution. So the fundamental root problem, it, it's kind of dealing with a symptom, not dealing with the cause of the disease. The cause of the disease is people are poor because they're excluded from market trade. They're excluded from entrepreneurship. So that's what we need to fix. And economic freedom does that. Socialism does not. Now, 
to get some empirical examples to your question, it's very hard for me to understand when my students suggest that socialism is a good idea when I point to modern day Venezuela. I mean, this is a society. Every day you could do a you know Google search an article about Venezuela and every day you get another story of how people are in line, there's no bread at the grocery store, babies are dying in the hospital because they can't get penicillin, something that in the United States my pharmacy has a big sign on the drive through and it says free antibiotics, meaning no price. So why is it that we have tons of penicillin and people in Venezuela have zero? Again, we could think in terms of redistribution and say, well, we have a lot, they don't have any, let's take a lot from us and give it to them. That might solve their problem tomorrow and it may be the case that we should engage in that charity. But that charity doesn't solve the underlying problem of why the heck don't they have penicillin? They don't have it because there's no incentives for businesses, for doctors to provide services. So it's, it's about a reform of the society which socialism cannot do. And to add another layer of complexity, as the state takes over more control of the economy, which is what socialism about, is about, right? It's about the public ownership of the means of production then the state automatically becomes more totalitarian. Because if you're gonna decide, you, you have this farm and you're gonna grow this, you have this manufacturing plant and you're gonna do this, I'm gonna tell you what to do, it's command and control, then there's no feedback, there's no profit and loss, there's no learning, there's no trial and error. So if the state gets it wrong, people are just in trouble. Sorry, no penicillin for you because we couldn't figure out how to make it work. So when that happens, the threat of revolution escalates and what happens? The government becomes more and more totalitarian. So totalitarianism is a natural outgrowth of socialism. It is a feature, not a bug. And I think we have to absolutely educate young people about this today because it's this myth that it's romantic and we're just gonna share and it's kumbaya and everybody's gonna be, we're just gonna take from the rich guys. It doesn't work. If it works, I would say let's do it, but it doesn't work. Let, let me come at it a couple of other ways. Um, the, the examples that are always given are you know, like three countries way up in the north that work that are about the size of Rhode Island. You know, Sweden, Denmark, and, and, and uh, Norway. Um, are, they, are they successful socialistic countries? They're not socialist countries. Uh, Socialism, again, implies that the state makes production decisions. The state tells you, you're going to own this factory and you're going to make nails. And then we're going to tell you how many pounds of nails to make. This is the Soviet Union, okay? This is where Venezuela is heading. Denmark, people are free to open businesses. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of entrepreneurship in Denmark. So when Bernie Sanders says we should be more like Denmark, in some ways he's absolutely right. We should stop the overregulation of business, which I think is one of the big threats in the United States today. It's much easier to open a business in Denmark than in the United States. That said, what Bernie Sanders is really referring to is the redistribution. So there's more redistribution of, you know, kind of taking wealth through taxation and spreading it in an, in an attempt to be equal, not perfectly equal, of course, over the broader population. Here's the other thing I would say. Denmark I, probably has a population of around 8 million. This is the size of Manhattan. So it's easier in some ways to engage in this type of activity when you have a smaller population that is more homogenous. The bigger your society is, the harder it is to be quote unquote socialism. So I think this is kind of like a trick question from the Bernie Sanders of the world. They are not socialist. It's not a socialist paradise. And they have improvements they can make as well. But if you look at their rankings in terms of economic freedom, Denmark and the United States are almost tied. So it's not a socialist paradise. All right. Um, this one, I'm going to ask you to think about it. And your, your teacher has just said that what I want you to do is give me three or four bullet points, just bullet point, five words, <coughs> seven words, after thinking about it. And it, it could have been shorter, teacher, but I ran out of time. Why does socialism, meaning the public ownership of production, tend to fail? What are, what are the bullet points that you would say as a teacher? Okay. You bullet want to hear your reasons. class say, you don't want a lot of verbiage, you just want bullet point one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Why does socialism fail? fail. What are why, the... does it tend to fa why does it fail? I, mean, yeah. I, I don't see a lot of... China's not socialism anymore. It is in certain sectors, but as mm -hmm. a whole, uh-uh, go ahead. 
The reason that socialism does not work in the long run, there's a couple of reasons, and they, they go right to the things we've been talking about. Who are we as human beings? And what are we capable of and what are we not capable of? So I think it comes down to anthropology and economics. One, people are self-interested, meaning I'm going to do what I think is going to benefit me and my family. That's true of me. That's true of somebody who runs a business. That's true of somebody who runs a government. So that's the first point. Everybody's self-interested. So you have to put the right incentives upon people. Why does the business leader open a business? It's not because he's this altruist who cares about everybody. Maybe he does, but the real reason is because he's going to earn a profit, or she, if they do that, and they do it properly. So incentives is the second reason. We're self-interested. We respond to incentives. We can't rely on altruism. That's the problem with socialism. It requires people to kind of have um, no incentive to do some of these things. The other thing... Uh, or idea is knowledge. F.A. Hayek, very famous economist in the 20th century, talked about what he deemed to be the knowledge problem. And he said the reason that socialism fails is because we don't know what we're supposed to do. I mean, think about some of the most successful companies. Walmart. Walmart didn't start out as the Walmart we know it today. Microsoft didn't start out. You know, Bill Gates is tinkering around in his parents' garage. This is a story of trial and error. They had to become that. Why? Because they constantly are engaging with their customers. They're trying to give customers better quality, lower prices. That's the name of the game. So the problem is that the socialist planners give orders, right? They say, start a, start a Microsoft and figure out how to get people what they want. See, the problem with that is that there's no competition. There's no way for me to learn. So I think that's the third kind of bullet point is we don't, the, the social planners do not know what the next invention is in five years that we need to be working on now. The only way Apple knows that is because they're in the mix right now and they're trying to figure that out. So it's about knowledge being decentralized. Socialism is very centralized. And then I think the last is benevolence. Socialism requires not only that we come overcome the self-interest problem, the incentive problem, and the knowledge problem, but we're going to give these social planners all this power and say, you do this, you do this, you do this. I'm an organized society. We're going to create prices. We're going to think of all the things because we're really smart. And then we're going to use all that power wisely and we're going to be benevolent. This is, never happens. So again, what I said before, socialism is always connected to totalitarianism because if you're going to give somebody that much power, there's no way for them not to use that power to their own benefit. So those, I think, are the major bullet points why socialism does not work en masse. Now, we can have small little, you know, we live in families. Those are kind of socialistic, right? I don't make my kids pay for their cereal. <laughs> but it works because I can plan for them even though not perfectly, and I love them. That's why families work. I love them and I care about them deeply in their long term. The socialist planner can't love all of us even if they wanted to. So those are the real you know, character flaws of socialism. It's interesting in your four points, you came back to the start where mm -hmm. self-interest, well, governments, the elite that are making the decision, they're also self-interested. Absolutely. And so, but they have way too much power, okay. Very good. Now, this is, this is uh, we all know that freedom and equality are contradictory values. Uh, you know, that's easy for people to understand. Here's the question. How do you resolve those key Christian values in your own mind? How do I Cause you, resolve? Because they're both legit Christian values. Equality and freedom. And freedom. How do you think about that mm -hmm. as a Christian? And, that, and then we're going to your, your chapter about inequality. Okay. Okay. The, it's easy for people, as you said, to understand the values of freedom. Um, and I, I think that this idea of the value of equality is a little bit trickier. What, what is the value of equality? I, again, if you asked a Bernie Sanders or even if you asked at, at, you know, kind of progressive evangelical, they would put that in material terms. They would say, well, equality is about material equality. And I think that is not a biblical understanding if you read the Bible front to back, uh, we're never promised material equality. Um, I, and I don't think that's the um, Christian or biblical understanding of that term. I think equality is we are equally loved by God and we bear these um, equal characteristics in our creation. 
Um, and so that's a very different conception. We are equal in dignity is how I would put that. We have equal dignity. Why? Because we are all created in the image of, and likeness of God. But we're different. So equality is not even a possibility. We look different. We think differently. Um, we have different skills and talents. So equality is actually contrary to our created image. We are created different. We're not created equal, but we're equal in dignity. Perfect. I, I want you to know when I'm looking at my watch, it's not to get you to speed up. It's because I want to respect your time constraints. Sure. No, so I'm staying on that. Tell me okay. if I need to. No, you're, no, no, you're good. I mean, I think we're good. I'm a talker. Uh, you it, well, no, I think we're great. I just want to finish on time, um, given what you said. So, uh, all right, now we're into your chapter. And for those who haven't read the book like me, you, you're, the title of your chapter, and this won't be on my uh, on, on your interview, but I'm just saying in a conversational way, the 1% is income inequality evidence of exploitation. That's a really good way of putting it because that's kind of the issue. That's what mm -hmm. people are saying. So what are your primary themes? I really wanted to come at this idea of inequality from, again, from a Christian perspective, uh, but also kind of to help people walk through, should we even do anything about this? I mean, that's an open question. So I wanted to try to address that. And what we're talking about here in this chapter is income inequality. We're not talking about inequality of dignity or something like that, because I've just made the case that, you know, if you, if you believe scripture, we're equal in dignity. So that's our starting point here. So the question is, if we're equal in dignity and we live in a society where people earn different amounts of money, is that a problem? What does it mean? And the answer is always, as any good economist would say, it depends. So if we live in a market-based society, right, with free enterprise and economic freedom, how do people earn their money? They earn it because customers give it to them. The only re reason that Steve Jobs died a very wealthy man is because lots of people want to have Apple products. Um, there was no coercion. And he had to compete with Michael Dell and Bill Gates and all these other people to get that position. And so the good thing for consumers is I'm not forced to buy my iPhone. I can buy a Samsung or something else. And so this is what we, you know, wanted to really dig into was, is the fact that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, that they have a massive amount of income compared to me, uh, is that a problem? Not in a society where he earns it because customers are buying their products. Now, income inequality can be a problem. And I d try to address that in the chapter when it's not earned income, when we're using the state when we're using corruption, when we're using bribery, when we're using oppression to try to extract income from other people. So it's a sophisticated level of nuance we have to have here. And then I kind of talk through how we measure it and all that type of thing. But I think the answer is it depends. But the best chance you have for income inequality to not be a problem is in a society where the rich only get rich because customers want and like what they're doing. You've been listening to economist Ann Bradley, Vice President of Academic Affairs at the Fund for American Studies in Washington. In the next and final episode of our conversation with Ann, she discusses a tool called the Gini Index. What is it, and why is it important in addressing income inequality? We'll find out in our next episode. I'm May Lily Lee. Thanks for joining us for our podcast conversation with Ann Bradley. Subscribe or follow us anywhere you listen to podcasts and visit us at praxiscircle.com.